Welcome to this interview series ahead of Big Data and AI World on the 6th and 7th of March at Excel London. Stuart Crowley, editor of Techerati, and today my guest is Mark Beckwith, director of data governance and architecture at the Financial Times. Mark's going to appear at data, Big Data and AI World in March, but today we're going to have a look back at three significant years of his life and career that shaped his life and career. So hello, Mark, and welcome to this interview. Hi, Stuart. Thanks for having me along and uh, really looking forward to this and to also the event in March. What have you chosen as your first significant year? Uh, so that would that would be my first full full year of work uh, back in 2001. Feels a complete lifetime ago. Um, I spent uh, three months the year before uh, with my first employer. It was a, a consultancy in the automotive industry. Uh, and then at the start of 2001, I was let loose uh, on that, on their main client, which was uh, Ford Motor Company. So I, I work client side down uh, in Essex, um, based at their office, uh, which uh, host, which housed Ford of Britain, Ford of Europe. So it's a huge, big office, full of full of Ford employees with the old agency head uh, littered uh, littered around. So learned quite a lot quite quickly. And what that experience was like working um, with such a, a large client. Uh, yeah, so very daunting. I was really green in the in the world of work, um, and wasn't really very conscious of of how that client supplier relationship worked. Um, you know, I felt I was kind of you know one of one of the kind of wider team uh, in in the office, but you know the reality of the situation were clearly you know I was I was I was being paid for to be there to do a certain job, um, but. You know, I think uh, I, I learned that quite quickly, that there was a slightly different dynamic to, to the um, to the office I'd worked in before working at, at Ford. And um, yeah, I think it was it was it, re it really kind of instilled in me the, the need to kind of listen, uh, be empathetic, to kind of build that trust and, and ultimately make the relationship even more effective um, for, for both parties. Was this a data-driven role that you were working on? Uh, does it relate to the this kind of data governance and, and architecture that you're working with now, or a little bit? Yeah, I think I think I was definitely exposed early, uh, very early in my career to you know the impact that poor data quality can have on on decision making. Um, you know, the the data that I was using back then quite a bit different in nature in terms of understanding. Uh, physical locations of dealerships, um, sales data, registrations data, uh, service data, um, and trying to kind of stitch all of that, of that together to ultimately um, make, make Ford more effective in terms of uh, its dealer, dealer network, uh, optimizing the number of dealers they had across the UK. So that's 23 years ago now. Um, how, how does that um, relate to, um, you know, what you're kind of facing now in, in, in the world of data and AI even? Um, yeah, like I said, there was a, there was a huge, huge data quality issue. I, I found myself um, trying to, almost trying to kind of rem remedy some some things myself when in reality it probably, probably, probably wasn't my, my role. My role there was to uh, feedback any issues back to the teams that could that could uh, resolve them. Um, I think I now in my time wh where I am at the moment at the Financial Times, trying to trying to instill this um, this uh, notion, if you like, or this this um, way of working where <clears throat> you have to, um, people in in, in disper very dispersed teams. Um, taking ownership of, of their data and the quality of their data, um, and I think you know, it, you know, I was a, I was definitely a link in, in that chain back, even back then, being someone who kind of looked and looked at, was looking at, touching and using that data day in day out. I was um, I was definitely kind of what I'm trying to champion now in terms of um, you know, data stewardship. You know, <clears throat> I was absolutely found myself in that role back then. I kind of was the, the person who probably knew that data inside out and had a role to play in terms of making sure that um, those data owners then were, were aware of any issues that there might be with that data. How did it, how did it feel to, to at that time as your first full-time role? What, what did that feel like? Um, I think at first I was probably a bit clueless actually. Like I said, you know, I was uh, 
I wasn't quite clued up on how this kind of, you know, how was, I was quite a, a different, I had a very different role to play versus those around me who were directly employed by Ford. Um, but, you know, as I, as I came to realize that, you know, that, that, that was this dynamic at play, <clears throat> I actually, I tried not to think too much about it actually, because otherwise, there was this, you know, I, I, I feared, I think at the time, if I can remember that far back, that I, 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 there was a risk I could kind of perpetuate this us and them um, situation. You know, I, would, I, was, I definitely saw myself as a really effective conduit between, between the two. And, and I see that now, actually, there's a really important role to play for, for people in organisations. One of my team, my contact governance team, um, play that role a lot. They they sit very much between, you know, they're that bridge between very technical teams, data engineering teams, and but like using the word the business, but effectively, you know, end users of data like marketing teams, for instance, you know, they they can kind of speak both languages, if you like. And, you know, I saw even way back when in, in, in my first role, the importance of having someone who, who could kind of bridge that gap. Is there anything you would do differently, but also are there any techniques that, that you would use nowadays to establish that conduit? Uh, yes. So I was I was reflecting on this actually with someone the other day. Um, I think I, uh, I don't know if this is this is a bad thing or not. Yeah, I think I definitely cared far too much back then. And that I don't, I don't mean that in a bad way. But, but what that meant was I often I would take things quite personally so if there were you know uh, if, if you know i had ford ford folks telling me oh that report's wrong again you know i think i got that you know um if i heard that enough then i i you know there was maybe the tendency in my you know when i was a bit more impulsive to kind of blow a gasket and then go back to the folks back at the ranch uh of my, of my employer and say oh got in the neck again about this thing uh and, and maybe fly off the handle a little bit uh too readily so definitely definitely learn that um yeah but i think you know that 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 conduit role i think is is really important having having someone who can who can really be the eyes and ears of a of a of a business or whether it's a business area embedded within a team who are kind of you know a few steps removed from from that from that organization or that department i think i think it's really really important you know i know at the ft we're we're definitely moving towards much more of an embedded model in terms of having data people embedded within business functions rather than having this kind of centralized team who are you know who who are maybe often quite difficult to get access to because they're balancing all these demands from all the various different teams how, how do you make that a success um embedding these data people into these uh, other teams say a marketing team or a, maybe a sales team or an operations team how do you make that a success yeah i, mean, I think i think that there can be some pitfalls as, as well because you know in my time at the ft you know especially earlier on you know this notion of having someone who is kind of ring fenced if you like to to service that that function can be a good thing but the risk of of it can be that they're then focused on much lower value things that they could be focused on for other teams you know there is the, you know when they're when they're operating with the blinkers on it's, it's obviously it's quite and, and often they might be funded by those various teams it it, it can um you can maybe miss miss opportunities to be looking at higher value pieces of work um but you know on the on the plus side like i said you know that this kind of sense of you know being the eyes and ears um really getting to know those t respective teams challenges what really matters to them and then you know being able to feed that back up to a centralized team to go you know what they yes they care about this but they care about this a lot more but maybe they just haven't asked because they they felt you know it was it was too big or too too hard or maybe even impossible to do so you know i think um i think both both parties if you like in terms of you know the the the, the, the marketing team or whoever it might be plus a centralized team both both benefit from from it if it's done well what have you chosen as your second significant year uh, so I will rewind 12 years. <clears throat> so I've been at the FT 12 years in February. 
Um, and so my first year uh, at the FT was in 2012. Uh, I always look back really fondly on that year, maybe slightly rosy tinted spectacles. Uh, a lot happened to me in this year. This is why I chose it. So obviously, as I said, I've joined, I joined the, uh, the FT early in the early part of that year. Um, and it was the first time I'd managed uh, remote teams. Uh, and I still still do to this day, but I inherited a team who were based in Manila in the Philippines. So learned a lot quite quickly about managing remote teams and had the great pleasure of going to see them within my first month of, of being at the FT. Um, uh, when I joined the FT, we were living in a, uh, a house that didn't really have, uh, well, didn't have any heating of any sort. Uh, we were doing a massive renovation project. Um, so we're living out of a couple of rooms. Um, so it was, actually, it was actually quite nice to go to Asia for um, for a, a week or so <laughs> and warm up. Uh, and then uh, we had our first child uh, in in the late summer uh, of that year, uh, in and around the the London 2012 Olympics. So you know, lots lots going on. And you know, I think I think back at that time where the FT were located uh, back then, our offices were on the South Bank, uh, quite close to London Bridge. And the business had gone out to um, to its employees to say, you know, if you can work from home, there's going to be, you know, London Bridge is one of those kind of transport hotspots. Um, so, you know, try and avoid it on these days if you can. And I remember people going, oh, no, I don't want to work from home. Um, you know, <laughs> fast forward 12 years and, uh, you know, we're in a very different world now. And, um, but back then, you know, this, this working from home thing was, uh, was a bit more of an alien concept. It sounds almost alien to me. I mean, you know, every, everyone was doing that in, 2020 not 2012 yeah and the the, the, tech, the technology to, to do it was you know, had these little tokens that you needed to log on to your vpn and it's all a bit slow and you know, not many people had, had sort of dedicated workspaces in in their home so um yeah, yeah. So that from, from reason for me was like well, i don't really fancy doing that i'd much rather you know stick it out and uh deal with deal with the uh, congestion and the yeah the commute thing how did you manage all that did what any sort of techniques to to manage your um your mental health even to <sighs> make sure that you stayed above board <laughs> on everything? yeah no it, it's yeah no it's a it's a it's a good question um you know i think the look looking back and it's easy it's, it's easy to do this in hindsight isn't it and you know i I probably possibly thought at that time, you know, all of these things were were so dependent on me being present and being in in the moment and putting my full effort behind it. But you know, in reality, you know, whether it was for work or house renovation or you know things, you know, the world doesn't stop turning. Uh, if you know, if you can't, you know, dedicate as much time as you would like to uh to you know the things that you really want to and you know and, and being in a leadership position now and having kind of you know i, I, I try and avoid doing this because i might scare myself but if i have to write down all the, all the various things uh that i'm i'm responsible for in my role i probably would scare myself but at the same time when i do catch myself thinking about it particularly when it's this time of year writing objectives for instance you, you know i'm comforted by the fact that you know you've got a team around you and also it's, it's great work in the ft it's a great place to work that there are you know people even outside your team who are there to you know to support you whether that's in you know just you know you, you mentioned mental health there you know we have a great mental health network at the at the ft uh, that many people tap into you know a huge amount of resources there to, to to allow people to balance all of the demands on their lives i think you know in 2024 we're much more uh, conscious of that than we were maybe in, in 2012 and you know i'm sure i got my uh uh i got in all of a fluster many many points during that year of you know this is taking too long or this isn't happening or this isn't just quite as quite as i wanted it to be um you know so if i, if I could go back and speak to my my 2012 version i would just probably tell him to don't worry it'll all be fine in the end comparing it to today the, the 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 perception and value of data has changed dramatically and it, i mean we all have this buzzword now of data being the new oil so um how how has it changed for you in in the 12 years that you've been at the, the ft 
how, how has it changed? Has, have you seen this value increase, your role increasing as well, the value of your role? What, what's changed in those years? Yeah, I think, I think back then, um, and, and I'm, sp I, I will speak sort of, you know, gen generalizing. Then I think there was, there was much more of a, a sense of, oh, well, you're the data team. You can sort that out. It's, you know, you, you look after all the data. Um, if there's anything wrong with it, it's like, okay, well, yeah, you, you're the data team. You're going to fix it, aren't you? Um, I think, you know, fast forward to now, there's, there is much more of an appreciation, I think, today. And I, I don't think it's just, just at the FT of the role that, um, you know, a whole organization has uh mm. in in getting the right data and maintaining it to a um, acceptable level of quality i think you know as as people's roles actually in whether it's in marketing or in product teams or, or where or even in a, in a you know an editorial team for instance you know they they've come to realize that the you know they get value from that data but they've also really firmly joined the dots between them having an impact on on that data whether it's like i said you know when i was in my first role really getting getting stuck in and and, and understanding kind of the nuances and uh, the pitfalls of that data and 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 knowing that there's a role for those people to play to to you know surface up those um you know potential inadequacies in that data to ultimately make it make it better i think there's this definitely more of this notion of data is a team sport rather than the preserve of you know a data team uh, you did mention um the, the phrase um the data team will fix it what what were some of the things that the data team would fix well um, i think often the like i, I mentioned just before you know there, there was this maybe less dots that would were, were joined um and so often what you find is you maybe be in this kind of iterative cycle where oh this data's kind of wrong mm -hmm. data team would fix it and then it go wrong again because the, the kind of the root cause hadn't been identified <clears throat> uh and often not always but you know often those data inadequacies came from uh you know not not maliciously or knowingly so from processes or practices in other teams that were, um, you know, would have been able to have a significant hand in making that data better. So for, you know, a really obvious example is having some sign up forms or registration forms or whatever it might be with like free text field for someone's job title or for the organization that they work for. You know, where, <clears throat> you know, when that filters through to some reports and someone gets a report and goes, oh, I've got, I've got, I've got 10 PWCs here. Like, well, you know, do I do need to roll them up or how to, this, this, this report's not working for me. Like, well, the way you fix that is by, you know, having those teams either enter those things consistently or having means to enter them consistently. And, and so, you know, I think, I think now there is this, you know, like I said, there is this appreciation of its, of this kind of virtuous circle from a, certainly from a data quality perspective. When it comes to data quality in action, do you think do you think we're successfully doing it? I, it depends what you mean by we. I think uh, at the FT, um, we definitely have a much heightened appreciation of the need to do it well, largely because uh, you know, many, many more people understand the value that it has, particularly with AI exploding uh, on the scene. <clears throat> um, never has Kind of, you know, garbage in, garbage out, being more true. Um, so, so yeah, I think um, you know, in the industry as a whole, um, you know, many of the events I've been to in the last sort of six to twelve months, uh, and and you know, from um, people I speak to uh, and and know via social networks, <clears throat> they are they are all saying the same thing, which is. You know, it's no point getting really excited about dabbling with AI if your kind of, you know, if your foundations on which it's built and the data that you you are feeding it hasn't hasn't had the right level of investment uh, over it. And I, I, I think AI has been helpful in that respect in getting more focus on you know teams like my own uh, in various other organisations. I've certainly felt that 
this year with uh, you know with the amount of focus and uh, attention that, that we're getting and, and things that we're being asked to do.